Turn, if you will, in your Bibles to the first uh, epistle of John. <clears throat> I'm going to start a series on 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And there's reason for this. Uh, I may have done this once before. I don't know. In 20 years, I have a tendency to forget everything that I did over the years. Do you all have that problem? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not alone. <clears throat> First John chapter 1. Uh, the series is going to be a pastoral epistle for our time. The things that uh, John has recorded are such that uh, are very, uh, not a part of the Word of God that's not relevant. But these are very relevant for the times in which we live. Uh, times are certainly uh, very different and changing, and we never know from one day to the next just exactly what's going to take place. But as the last song we sung, we know who holds tomorrow, and we know that we're in His hands as children of God. Now, we uh, there's there's some definite things that that give us that uh, connectivity. And, of course, it begins with salvation. But we're going to talk about fellowship. We're going to talk about walking with the Lord, some things that we must do. There are people that are uh, just don't understand today. So many religions in the world, and, and uh, uh, say false religions, whether religions that are misleading and guiding people not in the way of Christianity, not in the way of, of Christ, not in the way of His Word. Uh, some, even in religions, don't even uh, accept the Scripture as being the inerrant Word of God. So there's things that uh, uh, we face in our times which is uh, so different. And some things that you and I know that we're experiencing some things that we've never experienced before. Uh, when I ask you, and some of you can certainly relate to this, but when I talk to my niece and nephew about my sister, uh, they're totally in the dark. They just don't know how to go about handling the situation. We've never done this before, Uncle Jerry. We just don't know. I said, well, I'm going to try to help you and guide you. But I couldn't go in and see them unless I had a COVID test and tested negative and all this sort of stuff. And so she and Patrick are able to go in. But uh, times are, are changing. Things change. People change. Uh, health changes. Circumstances change. But God never changes. He's always the same. His word is always the same. I'm glad we don't have to go to school again to learn again what Jesus is teaching now because he's teaching the same thing now as he did when he began. It's all in word. The problem is, now listen to me carefully, they're, they're, the problem is that uh, people hear with the ears so many times what the word of God is saying but don't apply those truths to their life and you know, it's kind of like having a, a glass of tea. You can set your glass. I got some water right here. That water's never going to do me any good unless I drink it. Amen? Well, the Word of God's the same way, folks. You got to take the Word of God and apply it to really understand and know just how real God is and how true He is to His Word. So the pastoral epistle is what I've... Uh, title this uh, for our time pastoral epistle for our time I want you to look at uh, I'm going to read John chapter 1 first 10 verses because we're going to cover that first chapter today and, and then I'll expound on some of these things as we go along uh, just to emphasize what John is saying in these uh, these uh, this text Verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard. Now, let me, let me stop right here just a minute. If you've got a highlighter, 
or you got a pencil, as we go along and read these, every time you see a personal pronoun, circle it or highlight it. And then when we get through, see how many you got, okay? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, and was manifested or made known unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So much to be said about these verses that I will not be able to cover all of it by any means, but I'm gonna hit some highlights along the way as to about what it's all about. The Epistle was written by John, the same uh, writer of the Gospel of John. Uh, we'll say more about that in just a minute. But there are four uh, basic themes that are expressed in uh, these uh, words that I, th that I want to cover uh, three of them basically this morning, but one in particular. The first one, and I'm not going to cover it. Uh, we can go back to Corinthians and read some more on the, this particular subject, but the four themes addressed in this short epistle. Number one, it has to do with uh, uh, dealing with Gnosticism. And uh, that's a lesson in itself. And uh, I'm not going to elaborate a lot on that this morning. As I said, the author is the same as the Gospel of John. And the Gospel of John uh, was written to affirm the eternality and the preexistence of the Christ who became flesh. So while John's Gospel presents the deity of Christ, the first epistle emphasizes his full humanity. Now some have said, sometimes uh, you hear preachers preach and, uh, and I've heard people say, well, it sounds more like the teaching than they are preaching. Well, you can't, you can't undo those two. If you're not doing some teaching and you're preaching and you're not doing it preaching and you're teaching. Huh? Some of you remember Dr. E. Harold Henderson, Dr. E. Harold Henderson, and you, you've gone through in the Sunday school lessons on the, the doctrines and so forth, but he was an excellent speaker 
an excellent expounder of the scripture. He taught a lesson every time he preached. And uh, every time he preached, you could get something out of what he's saying. He, he preached and he taught. He taught. Okay? And uh, we want to try to do that in our preaching is when we share the truths of God's word, there's truth there that, that uh, is to benefit us. In my time in the ministry, when God called me to preach, he knew, uh, he knew my limitations. Uh, you know, sometimes that's a problem that we have. We don't know our limitations. But God does. You know, you've heard some that uh, every time you talk, they, they know, they know, they know. I know, I know, yeah, I know, I know. Can't talk to them because they already know it all. But I got news for you, they don't. Amen. We need to listen to what God says. I don't know what all God says. But in my ministry, what I want to try to do is bring out from the scripture that which we can, we, we can get it on Sunday and we can use it on Monday, Tuesday through Saturday. Because it's, I want to bring out and point out scriptures that we can apply daily to try to draw us closer to the Lord. Well, I don't know how successful I've been trying to do that, but that's been my intent and it still is today. I want to bring to you from the word of God always the truth. But I want, you to bring, I want to bring something to you that you can take and experiment, try it, put in application in your life and see if it don't benefit you. The greatest problem with, we have with God, you know what it is? It's disobedience. It's disobedience. We don't do what he says to do. Anybody guilty of that? Three, four? Okay. Rest of you hadn't learned it yet? <laughs> I'm kidding. You know that. The themes are designed to accomplish a number of tasks. And that's what we want to try to highlight today. Now, I told you about the author. The author is the same as the Gospel of John. And John's gospel presenting the deity of Christ, but this epistle presenting the humanity of Christ. So as John begins in writing these uh, ver words in chapter one, is just uh, a, a testimony really from John concerning his relationship as to who Christ is and his personal experience with him. How many of you circled uh, personal pronouns as we was going along or highlighted them. Anybody? If I, if I, my calculation's wrong, I think there's about 29 times in those verses that personal pronoun, we, our, uh, so forth, is, is used in these, uh, in these verses. Another thing about the epistle is it wasn't written to any specific church. It was all to the Asiatic churches. It's all, the, it's just as relevant to us today as it was back then when John wrote it. So is all the scripture. But when we come to the New Testament scriptures, especially the uh, letters that the apostle Paul wrote, they're instruction to us as to how one ought to behave himself in the house of God, in the church, in that relationship. So John's just expressing a testimony of, of what he has experienced and what he has, uh, has, has been manifested to him in his lifetime. I wonder how much of this we could... Now, I know some of these things we can't relate to as far as what John did. But by faith and trust in him, we can relate to these in the fellowship 
that we can have with God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that alone separates a lot of folks. Anybody that don't believe in Jesus Christ, they, oh, there's a God, but not he, not Jesus was just a, uh, no. You see, you done messed up. Uh, by the way, the uh, uh, online service today is being recorded and it'll be played at a later time because we, the, uh, we can't get into the system this morning uh, to get that done. But anyhow, the, uh, the theme addressed. The second and important theme in the first, uh, in first John, uh, you might want to jot these down. I, I'm, I'm taking these from a, from a study Bible, from a critical study Bible that uh, lays out an outline. That's what I'm going to follow that outline as best I can. Uh, but the second and the most important theme, very important theme in first John is the assurance of salvation. If you know that you're saved, you know that you're saved. If you got a doubt about your salvation, you got a problem with salvation. Amen. Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. No man can take them from me. In other words, people say, I don't believe in that once saved, always saved. Well, you got a problem. You got a problem. If Jesus said he can keep you, he can keep you. If he gives you eternal life, are you listening? That don't mean temporary. It means eternal life. From the day that we trust Christ as our personal savior throughout the rest of eternity. Are you getting sleepy? Or are you listening? Throughout all eternity, we're his. And we're kept by him. Listen to me. We're not kept by what we can do. And I said a while ago, one of the major problems we have is what? Obedience. But listen, it's in his mercy, in his grace, through the power of the Holy Spirit within us that gives us what we need to stay in a close fellowship with him. There's so much to cover in this that I won't, I'll, I'll probably not cover it good. But in him, uh, the first John theme is the assurance of salvation. There are phrases emphasizing Christian certainty uh, that occur five times in this short epistle and stress the believer's relationship with Christ. The second, we're going to cover these a little more in detail, but the, or the third, that was the second, and the third prominent theme is love. What the world needs today is the love of God. What a difference. How many of you listened to Dr. Jeffries this morning? Anybody? Dr. Jeffries uh, uh, talking about end times and the way things are going. He said, we're, he said, I really believe we're in the preparation time for the Antichrist. And he spelled out a little bit more on that. He doesn't know. I don't know. You don't know. But God knows. And as far as the rapture, we don't know when Jesus is coming back again. And he don't even know. He'll come back when God says, son, go get my children. Right. Amen? Amen. And so until then, our responsibility is to be ready. It may be today. It may be tomorrow. But you know, tomorrow is like that sign I told you about that's on the side of the uh, building at uh, uh, the Mexican food restaurant there in uh, Mineola. It says, free enchiladas tomorrow. Tomorrow never comes. When tomorrow comes, it'll be today. 
So we better be ready today for Jesus to come back and to rapture his church. So the third prominent theme is love. And the word appears in the epistle more than 20 times. And the fourth theme is this. Is that of a proper Christian behavior. Christians behaving like Christians <clears throat> ought to behave. And so, first of all, I want to share with you number one in our outline today is the realities of the Christian life. Now, this theme starts at chapter 1, verse 1, and goes all the way through chapter 2, verse 17. Well, we're not going to cover that many verses today. We're just going to cover these 10 verses. And like I say, I, I won't be able to do them total justice, but we'll share some things maybe that will help you a little bit. The realities of the Christian life. The first part of that is recognizing the word of life. Now, <clears throat> sometimes we read over a passage of scripture and, and uh, or maybe we read something else or whatever it might be, but we read it and we really don't even thought we just read it. Yeah, I heard it. I, I read that, yeah. Well, when we read the word of God, you ought to do more than read it. You ought to meditate on it. Meditate on what it's saying because when we talk about the word of life, and we talk about the Bible, we talk about God, the word of God. We talk about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. These are things that we, we need to recognize and pay attention to and, and glean from, meditate on. What's it saying? You see, God's speaking to us. And God uses us in his kingdom work to speak to others. How can we speak to others faithfully and truthfully if we don't meditate on what God is saying and make sure what we repeat is what God says? Keep your mind and your heart fixed upon him recognizing the word of life. Now, I'll have to hurry, but in, look, go back to your scripture now. Go back to the text and look at verse one. Because these are things that, where it starts out, when John is talking about what he himself had experienced. Notice he said in verse one, that which was from the beginning, let me reference right quick John, what he wrote in Gospel of John chapter 1 and verse 1. You remember? He said, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then on down to verse 14, he says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You see the connection between God, Father, Son, and believers? So, he said, that which was from the beginning, which, now here we go, we have heard. Which we have seen with our eyes. You remember, they asked him about God, and they said, Jesus said, you remember, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Now, this is what we're talking about, study and see what the Word of God says. The reason why this is important, folks, is because you're a child of God. If you're not a child of God, you need to be. And the only way you can be is believing through His, in his Son, Jesus Christ, and through the forgiveness of sin. Well, okay, we have heard, we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have handled of the word of life. There's that personal testimony of John recognizing 
these things because he had witnessed them. He had seen them. First hand witness. John says, I was there. I'm declaring unto you what I saw, what I witnessed. Can you imagine what it would be like to walk in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? We should, by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. Well, John declares the truth. I was there, and I'm declaring to you what we've seen, what we looked upon, what our eyes have seen, and what our hands have handled of the word of life in his presence of Jesus Christ the Father, the Son. Now, secondly, he said, for the life that was manifested and we have seen it, we bear witness and here's what we show unto you. Show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested, made known unto us. We think about John and think about all the, the spiritual abilities or a spiritual relationship and so forth. John learned these things just like you and I learned these things in that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. You see, you're not going to understand the Father if you don't understand the Son. And you're not going to be in a right relationship with God if you don't accept His Son because that's His means of fellowship. And He talks about this word of life as being show unto you that eternal life. Jesus Christ, that eternal life, that word of life. And it was manifested unto us. There's no another one of those personal pronouns. And verse 3, that which we have seen, we have heard, we declare unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Where's the fellowship in the world today? no fellowship in the world. There's no fellowship. Sin and righteousness have no fellowship. They don't mix. We wonder why the world's in such a condition that it is today. Well, look at man's relationship with God and you see what the problem is. We've seen, we've heard, we declare unto you about the fellowship that you can have with us and we with the Father, with each other. So many things come to my mind that I want to chase a rabbit on, but I don't have time to chase a rabbit this morning, okay? I could follow him pretty good in the snow today. Look at verse 4. These things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Now don't raise your hand. I'm not asking you to raise your hand and do anything like that. But how many of us could say today that our joy is greater than it's ever been? And our joy is growing day by day by day by day. Well, sometimes we, miss, we uh, mix up joy and happiness and we get them confused. You can have joy and not be happy. Happiness comes, someone has gave the definition, and I put it on my wall. Happiness is learning to like what you have to do. Uh, there are relationships that my niece and nephew is going through right now, and I've gone through, Gary's gone through, Brenda's gone through, Bateman, everybody's gone through situations that are different and tough and hard. 
But oh, the beauty of God's grace, God's power, God's provision, and the peace that comes as a result of that what? That relationship. The world's in chaos today. They don't have that, they don't have that relationship, that pattern, you see. And folks, when I say, and I, and I put on this thing, you know, uh, one of the urgent needs is pray for our nation. Our nation's in the worst shape I've ever seen it in my life. And uh, only God knows what's going to take place tomorrow. But I got peace that passeth all understanding because I know he's in control of it. That has to do with our personal relationships as well as the relationship that the world has with God. God's in control. God's given man every opportunity under the sun. Showing mercy to mankind to give them opportunity. He's merciful to us to give us opportunity from day to day to walk in a more close closer relationship, closer relationship with him and have that greater fellowship. Well, like I say, I've got to hasten, but in verses 5 through 7, here's the understanding of the character of God because this, this is what John says is the message. This then is the message which we have heard of him. We've heard it from him, of him. Go back to verse 4 again. Are you back at verse 4? You remember he said, we declared this message unto you that your joy may be full. A lot, a lot of folks not experiencing the full joy of God today. I will explain that to you in just a moment. This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. God is our vision. God is our hope. God is everything that man needs to walk in this world in a right way, in a right relationship with God. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Go back to what he said in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. Now he says, disciples, followers, you are the light of the world. Now go let your light shine. Don't hide it under a bushel. Go let your light shine. I like the little song we used to sing. Remember this little light of mine? I'm going to let it shine. Amen. Amen. Now, God is light. Now, he has made us to be light in this dark world. Now listen, look what he said. In him there's no darkness. When we're walking in full joy and full fellowship with him, there's no darkness, there's light. And he tells us our lights ought to be shining. Ought to be shining brightly that others can see the light and know him. Now, I want you to look at verse 6 and verse 7. Because we understand the character of God as to who he is as being light, and uh, the message, if we say, now we're getting down to the humanness of all this thing. If we say that we have fellowship with him, now this is where religion comes in. Are you listening? You see, when we say if we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, not understanding the word of faith, not understanding who Jesus Christ is. Now, folks, listen to me. We have, there's no place for us to compromise God's word. Right's right and wrong is wrong and there's no gray matter. When it comes to God's word, God is our only hope. And that hope is through his son, Jesus Christ. And any religion that wants to try to teach otherwise is wrong. 
walking in darkness and teaching in darkness. He said, if we say that we have, in our walk, personal walk with God, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie. We lie. I'll go further on that in just a minute. And we don't do the truth. If we have a, if we have a little sin in our, little hidden sin, you know, it's not too big a thing, uh, but we hold on to it in our life and God understands. Yeah, God understands that you're not walking in fellowship with him. If you don't, if every sin's not confessed, then we're holding on to something that causes darkness. And we think we, we know and we can handle it. No, you can't. No, you can't. Sin and righteousness don't dwell in the same house. And so God who cannot lie says that if we're holding something in our life that's contrary to the way and the will of God, then we're not in fellowship with God. I can do it my way and get by. No, you can't. No, you can't and not have the fullness of joy. Now, some people don't like to hear that, but I'm just telling you what, what the word of God says. So, look at verse 7. We're talking about the character of man, the relationship with God, understanding the character of God. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, actually he is the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sins. Did you know that if people just simply go by, if, if Christians, God, people that claim to be Christian, if they just go with that one verse alone in the scripture, there'd never be a Baptist split. Hello? We wouldn't care whether the piano was over here or over there, or organ was over here or over there. And don't think people hadn't split in their churches over simple stuff like that. Well, this is the way I think it ought to be, and if you don't do it this way, we go out and get our own church. No, you're not going to have fellowship with God when you're trying to do it your way. You do it God's way. I've had people split hairs with me on a lot of things on stuff like this. But I'm telling you, by the grace of God, that's the only way I can say, by the grace of God, I'm going to stick to what God says. You don't have to go by what I say. Let's see what God says. And everything and every decision that we make ought to be based upon thus saith the word of God. Well, I've got to hurry. Now, the third part I want to share with you this morning has to do with the experiencing of a new kind of fellowship with God. Verses 8 through 10. Keep your scripture open. Here again, he says, notice that verse starts with that little word, if. You see this if throughout through the thing, if we say, if we say, if we say and don't do, then we do not the truth. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Guess what? And the truth is not in us. Truth is what sets men free from the bondage of sin. But in verse 9, I don't know how many times I've used this verse down through the years. If we confess our sins, our sins, I'm not here to confess yours and you're not here to confess mine. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And the truth, his word, is not in us. How important is the word? How is important is the word of God to us as we look to it as the Bible? But John's going further and saying the word of life, which is Jesus Christ. The word of God, God himself speaking to us through these scriptures this morning, folks. 
You see, people are deceived by their own belief. But God, but God says, if you confess, he'll cleanse. You confess and I'll do my part and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He said, if you don't do it this way, you're calling God a liar. And God don't lie. You see, it's a, what you say versus what you really are. You see about the character of God and the fellowship with God. The conclusion is just simply that we have a relationship with God based upon our faith and our trust in him. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Can you argue with that? When he says, if you say you have no sin, you lie and do not the truth. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But there's many in religions today that uh, don't acknowledge sin in their life. And there's, there's, there's what we call true churches today that don't want to talk about sin. I'm telling you, you never get saved if you don't know you're a sinner. It's sinners that get saved. Sin is something that every person has to deal with. Since Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, sin entered and as Romans 10 uh, tells us, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, for by one man sin entered the world and death by sin. So all have sinned. All have to deal with death. That separation from God. Man has to recognize that he's a sinner, has to confess his sin and trust God seeking his forgiveness of sin, turning from sin, turning from sin to walk in oneness, to walk in a different direction of life, to walk from sin and not with it. You can't, you can't hold sin in your life and have complete fellowship with God. Anyone who does not confess <clears throat> this, does not believe this, as directed by the word of God, will spend an eternity in a devil's hell. A man has to be warned of that. It's our responsibility to teach the truth lovingly, to let people know that without Christ, you're not going to make heaven. Going to heaven? Oh, yeah. Well, how are you going to get there? Well, I do this, and I do that, and I do this, and I do that. Well, I tell you, if you don't believe in trusting Jesus Christ, you're not going. When John wrote in the gospel of John, the answer to Nicodemus was, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. If you're going to heaven, you're going God's way. You see, these verses have much to do with our character, with our relationship with God. So please stay tuned as we go through the epistles of John. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word and simplicity of it. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so much that you show your mercy to us and extend to us the opportunity to walk in a fellowship with you and a relationship with you that's just uh, uh, not understandable by the world. But Lord, thank you that you make it available to us. Thank you for loving us that much <clears throat> that you provided for us and provide for us today our every need as we trust you. Lord, we know that you're in control of all things, so may your will be done, and may we submit totally to your will. For it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's stand together saying, turn your eyes upon Jesus, okay? <clears throat>